Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode here at the Damage Report. It is Wednesday. Big news Wednesdays. Also JR Wednesdays because we're joined by JR Jackson. How's it going JR? What's going on? Oops. The news is so big that it is rocking the city. <laughs> JR is <laughs> bouncing up and down. Uh, JR, we are very, very excited to have you back. How have you been? Oh, I'm good. How are you guys doing? Uh, you know, um, I'm a little bit all over the place right now. It's, uh, it's cloudy in Los Angeles and that confuses me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Difference. It's been blisteringly hot lately. Um, <laughs> but you know what else has been hot? The news, mm. because there's a lot of it. Uh, we're going to have some electoral returns. Uh, let's see. We've got, um, Trump perhaps trying to do a bit of damage control on Fox and Friends on a variety of different topics. The latest on the negotiations between, uh, the Senate and the White House on coronavirus aid. We're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that. Uh, Epstein, a member of a certain exclusive club he had been uh, said not to be. We're going to uh, reveal that. And then finally, we're going to talk about a story we're unfortunately weren't able to get to yesterday, which is um, vaccines and Fox News and how they're going to discuss it and whether anyone in the end is going to end up taking it. So we're going to talk about that as well. Um, I did want to mention before we jump into our stories... Uh, we are going to be having a, uh, a, a Lebanese journalist on the show uh, in an interview after the live show. So that'll be going up later today. So we're going to be talking about you know some of the new information about yesterday's you know tragic explosion, which apparently killed more than 100 people. And there's a lot of ripple effects from that that are incredibly significant. So we will be discussing that not on the, the live show, but there will be an interview later on. I wanted to bring on someone who's an actual expert, which I yeah. definitively am not. <laughs> well, the one thing you can't say, John, that it was an attack. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it would be it would be irresponsible <laughs> to simply declare that it's an. <sighs> he j- I don't know which would be worse if he just declares it was an attack and it wasn't; it was an accident, or if he just declares it was an attack. And that's because he has secret intelligence that it was. I don't. Ah, he doesn't. It was. It was a mistake. Everything that we we believe we know is that it was a tragic mistake, perhaps negligence. We'll find out mm-hmm. more, as I said with the expert. But Trump just said it was an attack. How? How? Well, we know it's not secret intelligence because he doesn't pay attention to <laughs> the out and open intelligence either. That's true. We know it's not intelligence because it's <laughs> Trump. But I. Yeah, I can't. Every day is a new assault on my soul, and I don't want it, and I won't stand for it, Um, except I will because there's nothing I can do about it. But in what, like 91 days, we get a chance potentially to switch things up? You know, by the way, so to, Mm -hmm. to have a little bit more bad news before we start the show, so let's say hypothetically we go through the next three months or whatever, we have election day, and you know what? Trump loses. And you know what? We even find out about it that day. And (laughs) cherry on top, Trump uh, acknowledges that he lost. You know the the pickle in the middle of that Sunday? He's still Mm. president for months. (laughs) And he will be unbound. Well, he's pretty unbound. But... He, he won't have, like, he's just going to leave anyway, and he can pardon himself and anyone else. What would he do on the way out? How many bags filled to the brim with flaming poop are we going to have <laughs> to deal with before he's finally gone? I never thought about that part, John. That's going to be uh. a dark time. That's midnight in America, my friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, with that, though... We do have a lot that we're going to get to with uh, the time that we have. Um, continue. You can um, chat along. You can send in tweets, hashtag TDR uh, live. You can send us super chats. We're going to be reading those. I did want to let you know about one or two things. One, we are in a new month of the fundraising drive at tyt.com slash go to make sure that this company remains a thing. So, um, you know, obviously very hard times. Uh, totally understand if you if you can't or choose not to give at this point. But if you can, we would very much appreciate it. Um, the audience has been inc- like shockingly supportive so far uh, during this effort, and we definitely need it. So thank you to everyone who's taken part in that already. I did also want to let you know about an upcoming special that we're going to have. So this is an exciting one. It's the What Does the Future Look Like uh, special on TYT. They're gonna be, uh, it's going to be a conversation 
uh, about the future of race relations, the economy, technology, the elections, and more. Uh, Jank is going to be hosting it, but get a load of these guests. You're going to have Andrew Yang, uh, Derek Johnson, Dolores Huerta, Nomi Prinz, Nicholas Thomas, uh, and more guests as well, some yet to be announced. You can tune in on uh, Tuesday, August 11th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time. You know, twitchcom slash go, YouTube, Facebook. Twitch, Pluto, Samsung, Roku. I can just make up words and you'll probably believe it. Because there's a lot of places that you can listen to it. And so we have that. I've got a few other announcements to make later on. But you know what? Maybe we'll do some news. What do you think, JR? Big news Wednesday. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Let's get some big news. Big news, including big wins. Yesterday, elections, big old wins for progressives. You know who won? Do you know who won? Cori Bush won. Not Mm. me. Us. But also her. Us, yes, but also her, because Cori Bush, who Jenks says is was the first Justice Democrat, like, um, she ran in 2018, lost by about 20 points, uh, continued to be active in the community and in politics between 2018 and now, and that, that principle that we've been talking about, that the first run's important, but the second run might be the moneymaker, mm-hmm. when people already know who you are and you're building connections with the community... How'd you like a little demonstration of that principle? And Cori Bush is an amazing demonstration of that. Um, uh, you know, winning uh, in her second go. Very exciting. Uh, you know, as people were watching the the returns come in, Clay had apparently had a big lead. Lacey Clay, I should say, the longtime incumbent. I'm assuming at this point that you're fairly familiar with the electoral uh, situation. But he had a big win, um, a big lead among mail-in and absentee ballots. Uh, but she came back big... Uh, on election day, lots of t- great turnout, and eventually a three-point win. A 23-point swing in two years. That's what experience and, you know, all of that and, and activism and, and building your building your base and your field operation, all of that can give you. And so it is incredibly likely, considering the district, that she will be um, heading into Congress in not too many more months. Yes. Hey, um... So, I mean, like you said, it's a it's a testament of of persistence and continue to push your point and honestly, the uh, where this country needs to go. So, if people need to hear it enough, we've heard countless times that are like the normal things that we hear from politicians from either side of the aisle, and we don't hear these types of uh, moves and agendas and things that actually help American people. And if you just say it one time, enough some people may hear it, but then how much time have we really had to let these new ideas, which really shouldn't be new? Uh, actually penetrate our membranes and go, what if it did look like that? Wait, what if you could get enough of a coalition of people that would take the country in this direction? You know, when it started with a little bit of other things with Justice Democrats and other progressive candidates that have gotten in office, and it's only like four or six or ten of them at the different points. But yeah. then as it builds, you can be like, oh, wait a second, this is actually a thing. It's not something that it's a one uh, a political cycle type of thing that's going to happen. And I've said it before that the 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 re-election the the re-election of pe- many people like AOC and and uh, Rashida Tlaib and everyone is like the confirmation for seeing them in office and then go ahead and confirm it that we need this types of energy yeah. and these types of ideas. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting to see another, you know, another person that another candidate go down that uh, you know ev- all the people in the know uh, were saying couldn't possibly. And what, what's interesting about this race is that. Um, you know, I, people definitely didn't think that she would win outside of, you know, progressives and think that there was much of a chance. But this isn't one of those elections like with Crowley and with Angle, you know, against AOC and against Bowman, where they were so overconfident that they didn't even really run a race. I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was as true with Engel. It wasn't all at all true in this case. Like, Clay ran. Clay ran to try to defeat her again. He'd already ran once before, and she still won. This wasn't a you know, sneaking in the shadows, knife in the back. No, she faced him face to face and took him down with superior organizing, a superior platform, um, all of that. And that's one of the things that makes it so exciting. Now, she did receive um, benefits from some, or I should say a boost from some awesome organizations, including the Justice Democrats, who spent roughly $200,000. You have the Sunrise Movement helping to organize around her as, as they have around other candidates, as well as Matriarch, a new organization that backs working class women running for office. We had um, Namiki Konst on not too many months ago to talk about that organization. Uh, and so that's great. And it allows us uh, one additional time now 
to bring up this tweet that I will never get <laughs> tired of. Back in July 12th, 2019, um, there was a senior Democratic source who very boldly went anonymously off the record to say, no one is afraid of those nerds about the Justice Democrats. They don't have the ability to primary anyone. And AOC tweeted that out today with a little nerd face, <laughs> which is awesome. However, yeah, it's, uh, it sucks to, to, you know, have your tweets come back at you like this. You exactly. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the whole out, however, on this though, is that while I know that people watching this, people who watch a lot think John doesn't physically have it in him to criticize AOC. And I get why you would think that she didn't endorse Cory Bush, which I would have preferred. <laughs> and she should have, she should have, I get why she didn't, I guess, strategically, um, she, she endorsed Bowman after Engel, like, went on record saying that primaries are inconveniences, that only a pandemic is forcing him to actually campaign a little bit. Um, no, she should have in this case, too. Doesn't mean that she's terrible, doesn't mean she's a sellout, doesn't mean she's been devoured by the machine. Um, but I would, I would like to see a, you know, a change up in, in endorsement strategy in, in the next round. Yeah, and uh, maybe it's just my thing with endorsements uh, in general. I don't pay enough attention to them to believe that they'll change things. So that's a personal thing. If mm-hmm. I have a thought or I have an approach for a certain candidate and then there's some other candidate endorses the opponent, it doesn't make me automatically drop all the thoughts and beliefs that I had in support of this particular candidate. So an endorsement to me is almost like a, hey, I'm on board, not a, hey, I'm giving you life. Because it does, in my opinion, it wouldn't give – life to a candidate that I wasn't in support of. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. It's, it's just, I'm not as easily swayed, maybe because I'm a contrarian at times. So when the popular person says, hey, you know, you guys should do this, it makes me go, well, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's true. That's true. So, um, you know, b- maybe we'll see a change. Uh, but congratulations to, to Corey Bush. Um, there were other wins, including um, Missouri approved Medicaid expansion, which is going to expand it to about 200,000 more uh, low income individuals. An awesome loss with Chris Kobach losing his Kansas Senate mm. primary. Man, what a loser. <laughs> Chris Kobach is. Can't win elections. Can't find voter fraud. What a loser. Brad going back to Kansas to see if he could reclaim, you know, something with his name. Exactly. Yeah. It's not working out. No. And uh, one other big win. So we we had the initial members of the squad get elected. And one minute after that, the establishment began planning on how they were going to take these women down and get those seats back. And they thought they had opportunities for all of these. AOC, well, we got an MCC. That didn't work out so well. They think, Ilhan, she's so controversial. We can take her down. Yeah, we'll see about that. But they they really thought Rashida Tlaib, the most vulnerable member of the squad, she swears on video. She came out early in support of impeachment and was obviously right to do so. And so they decided to try to take her down. Good luck with that. She won by 32 points in her re-election primary bid, tweeting, Headline said I was the most vulnerable member of the squad. My community responded last night and said, Our squad is big. It includes all who believe we must show up for each other and prioritize people over profits. It's here to stay, and it's only getting bigger. Exactly, and that's and I think that embodies the whole thing of this. It's enough of a movement that's building that the distractions and the old videos of her at some conference getting mad at someone who she should have gotten mad at yes. uh, are seen as these things that are, are detriment. Can you believe this woman told the truth? Can you believe she actually stood up to racists? Y- yeah, actually, you know what? I, I, you know, maybe you guys can't believe it, but I'm glad that we're seeing it. And so it's, it shows the deta- how much you're detached from reality. If you see Americans going a certain way and you go, can you believe that, that she wants to help you? And yeah. you think that's going to be a winning strategy because that's what you, you've always leaned on nothing. You've always leaned on empty promises and things that you just tell the American people without doing anything afterwards for so long that when someone does the opposite, you go, can you believe this person mm-hmm. wants to do something? Yeah, you know, and I, I think forgot about that video of, of her getting dragged out like this impassioned mm-hmm. like speech that she's giving. Um, you know, like, I guess it was a town hall, something like that. Um that that they would look at that, the establishment would look at that and say, oh, no, not only do I not like that, but that won't play. She won't be able to get reelected now that we know that. Like, it's one thing to sit in your, your tower in your castle and look out on the peasants. 
It's another thing to sit in that tower in that castle and not even look out and have no idea how angry people are. How mm. could you not get that that's what people want? People want someone who fights passionately for their values and translates it into policy. That's what we want. We don't want, you know, 18-year incumbents that occasionally, like, walk through the neighborhood and wave and that's it. You never hear from them. They never deliver anything. They don't seem to care. They don't understand what their constituents want. Yeah, I don't get it. Well, they're learning. They'll learn. <laughs> Are you They'll sure? They'll learn. Yeah, <laughs> as, um, so we have the squad. And uh, I think it was Randy Bryce tweeted earlier today, uh, by the end of this election, it might be the platoon. And so I tweeted 2028, the Legion. Yeah, it's, mm. it, the squad's going to be big. It's going to be big because they keep picking off these incumbents. And each one, it, I think, makes it easier. It continues to inspire more people that have a, a, an American mindset that actually deals for the people that are regular Americans, right? All the time, we, we the only people that could run for office, which is not the way it was supposed to be, were the rich, powerful, people that were connected, and people that were placed there in order to help other people that are rich and powerful that want to continue to have a stronghold over policy and agendas of politicians. And again, this crosses both parties. So uh, when you, like some normal person from Michigan, normal person from Florida, a normal person from California, would be like, you know what? I can run. I have ideas. I'm not dumb. Like you can think of things that, that that honestly, it doesn't even require that much intelligence, really. Just listen to what married people want, see how things can work for us, and then say and then implement those things. Now that's maybe the hard part because you have to go through all of the red tape of of Congress, of Congress, and votes and 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 policy matters. All those yeah. things get complicated. But as far as getting into office, hey, say what people need and say what people want. Fight for it and put together a plan to get there. Yeah, exactly. So, look, um, the rest of the news from here on out is going to be terrible because 2020, but uh, <laughs> not a bad way to start the show. So that's good. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Donald Trump is fresh off his disastrous Axios interview which most of his base will never hear about because they didn't talk about it on Fox at all. But he is on Fox doing a little bit of damage control, talking with um, both the Fox and their friends. And uh, a couple different topics came up. Here he is again talking about how the post office does not deserve to be saved, mail-in voting can't be trusted, that sort of narrative. Your response to Hillary Clinton accusing you of sabotaging the post office. Well, first of all, you know, remember the famous question when she asked me whether or not I accept the results of the election? You know, she felt pretty confident until the end of that debate. And frankly, uh, she was very strong. Do you, would you accept the results of the election? Well, she didn't accept the results. She still has. It. She's living in a cocoon. And I guess people don't like her or somebody doesn't like her. But she was uh, she didn't do the job. She didn't do the job that she was supposed to do. And she should accept that. Now she continues 
to go on, and she's talking now about the Postal Service. Well, as you know, the Postal Service for 40 years has had big problems, and they're not equipped to handle a governor where they say millions of ballots, by the way, will be posted in a couple of weeks. A gear up. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. It's a very complex process. So Nevada, we're in court. We'll see how it works out. But if it doesn't work out, you're not going to know the November 3rd election results. I'm talking for the country. It could be for months and months. I mean, actually, it could be for years because you'll, you'll never. It, they sent and they plan to send these ballots to everybody that's ever walked in the state of Nevada. It will be a disaster. Years. Mm. Years. There's a, there's a few issues in that. Uh, what do you think, Jared? Yeah. Well, okay. Um, let's start with the first thing because I'm a little confused. Uh, and maybe and this is a legitimate question. This isn't a question to make a point. I'm I don't know when Hillary Clinton to this day hasn't accepted the 2016 results. I I, I don't know how. Like or or either that or he doesn't understand what that means to not accept. When people are saying you're not you may, if you lose in 20, would you not accept the results? That means are you gonna <laughs> <laughs> hunker down in the White House in your bunker and cross your arms and go, no, no. That's yeah. what people are asking. They're not asking, are you going to go, hey, these election results were questionable. Let's let's investigate this. Let's look into that. Recount this. All those things. They're asking if you're going to sit there physically and refuse to leave. Yes. I don't remember Hillary Clinton going, well, I'm going to move in anyway. I, I, I don't. Well, she don't did remember. chain herself to the White House fence that one time. It was very embarrassing. Yeah, no, well, it means, just, are you going to stay? stay? Yeah, yeah, you keep saying she hasn't accepted the results either. Didn't she, I, I, again, legitimate question, because my, maybe my, my memory is foggy from 2016. Did she not uh, have a concession speech and have a conciliatory call to him? Night Did of. all that not happen? Night of. Yeah, and I would say, I think he's gone a layer past what you're saying, where she's like, we should investigate. She's not, she's not suing him right now. Like, she's not challenging the results. She just wishes she had won. And that is very much not what we mean when we say accepting the results. I don't care if in four years after losing, Trump still wishes he had won. I don't give a damn about that. I don't, I don't know if he'll be around to do that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about legal challenges, trying to have the Supreme Court overthrow it, literally barricading yourself in the White House and refusing to lead, leave. That's what we're talking about. But on to the actual timeline... This continuing to try, I mean, nothing that he said here is totally new. And so we don't play it for the audience because this is the first time they have to hear it. But I want them to know what the arguments being made by the other side are. And the arguments are, it could take years to know who won if there's a little bit more mail-in voting than before for some reason. And so if some sort of drastic action happens on election night or shortly after... It's justified because I'm leading you to believe that otherwise the alternative is waiting for years. And that's unacceptable. And you need to be ready going into the election for that to become the default position of not just Trump, but more and more Republicans. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, again, it's, it's a repetition of constantly the same thing we'll see on TV. And I honestly, I don't think anyone's buying it. I, it's, it's, it's like you said, you, we've seen it over and over again, which is why maybe sometimes we don't put it all out there. But I'm curious. No one's buying this, right? I I hope not. <laughs> I, I really do. Um, but yeah, no that that's the argument. Of course, it you know it wasn't challenged. That whole it could take years. None of the Fox and Friends were like, "Well, that's insane." No, we've run plenty of elections with lots of mail-in voting. It might take a little bit longer, but I got news for you. What what we need to have, hopefully, is such an overwhelming day of result that we will have to wait to know for sure, but he mm -hmm. doesn't get to jump on a narrow lead night of and then pretend that that's representative. <music> Donald Trump had a big Axios interview where they talked about the fact that deaths were going up, hospitalizations were going up, the pandemic is bad once again like it was several months ago, but that has not led him to question um, his decision to push for as much school reopening and in-person attendance as possible. 
perhaps because uh, that decision has been founded on some truly bizarre and extreme ideas of kids and coronavirus. My view is the school should open. This thing's going away. It will go away like things go away. And my view is that school should be open. If you look at children, children are almost, and I would almost say definitely, but almost immune from this disease. So few, it's, they've got stronger, hard to believe. I don't know how you feel about it, but they have much stronger immune systems than we do somehow for this. And they do it, they, they don't have a problem. They just don't have a problem. B. We did the right thing. We closed it down, but now we're opening up. And now we understand the disease. We understand that the elderly, especially the elderly with a problem with diabetes or heart, if they have a problem, they're very, very vulnerable, very, very susceptible to this disease. And we have to be very, very careful and vigilant with them. And we are. Well, on that note, what about the elderly teachers or the teachers that are susceptible or have underlying conditions? Are you worried at all? Is that a concern that maybe one of the moms or dads who drops their child off might have COVID and not know it, pass it on to one of these teachers? I think the teachers are a different story, and if a teacher's in a certain age group, I think they shouldn't be going in, and probably they're going to have to wait till the thing goes by. Uh, they'll have to wait. It will go by. By the way, there's, oh. again, a few things there. Um, now, I know you, you have a kid. This, this impacts you more directly than me. What do you think? It's probably one of the few reasons why some conservatives that you just support them would even ask a question like uh, what Ainsley asked, asked him. So since seven-year-olds don't teach second-grade classes, what about the adults in the room? And so, there, by the way, his answer required even more follow-ups, which was, so if the vulnerable teachers leave, which how many vulnerable teachers are there, Mr. President? Uh, what age range does that start? What if it's a 40-year-old that has some kind of underlying policies, uh, uh, problems? Uh, all those things. So when they do leave, then who steps in and for how long? How long before this blows over, like you just said? Does it take a week? Is it a sick day like you're describing it to be? None of this makes any sense. So, or you could say, hey, Mr. President, or did you not think this answer through? How much have you put into this thought process? Nothing, apparently, because when a teacher leaves, who's replacing them and for how long and why would they? You think after a teacher leaves because maybe they're, they're worried about getting sick, some kid in the class has it confirmed, uh, then are, are, are you going to be the teacher that goes, hey, you know, I'll, I'll go in that classroom, hey, pick me to pay me a couple of dollars an hour to do this. No, that's not what's going to happen. It's absolutely not what's going to happen. And that question needs to be asked next. One more thing, John, before I let you go ahead and talk. <laughs> this morning, um, uh, this elementary school in Cherokee County School District began in-person classes on Monday. That would be two days ago. By Tuesday, which is one day ago, the classroom was temporarily closed for deep cleaning and the teacher for the teacher and 20 other students had to be asked to quarantine. You know why? Because on after that first day of school, a, a, a second grader tested positive for COVID-19 because they're, they're, they're I'm going to almost say, completely immune to it. Okay. Why isn't yeah. your kid going to school then? Your 14-year-old. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, just like you instantly when he said that, because he's, he's like, they're immune, which isn't true. They're not immune and they can spread it, which we'll get to the numbers in just a second. But... Um, then he's like, but, you know, we do have to be worried about the elderly. And then she she asks, um, you know, a good follow-up question. So what about all the elderly people that are at schools with the kids? And I instantly thought, well, that's interesting. Yeah, what, what are the percentages anyway? And so I looked it up and um, found some information. It's from 2011, 2012. It's the most recent information I was able to find in about a minute. Um, and uh, interestingly, three out of four public school teachers, female. Doesn't affect this necessarily, but that is interesting. Um, percent that are 55 or older, 18.8%. Percent. percent that are 50 to 54 is 12%. So that's already, we're at 30% are 50 or older. You know the percent that are less than 30, the super good immune systems? 15% <laughs> of teachers. The median age is 41. Now this data is nine, huh. years old, uh, nine years old. I can't say, but in the last nine years, do you think that teachers have gotten younger on average? I don't know why they would. This is a terrible, terrible, terrible decision, not only for the elderly people that are going to be there, but also for the families. Because here's the thing, as we have mentioned on the show previously, those who are below 10, the most recent studies indicate they are half as likely to share COVID as uh, an adult. Half as likely, not 2% as likely. 
that still seems really likely. You should be half as scared. And the teacher is going to be surrounded by 20 to 40 of these kids. How many does it take? And that's that's for people who are less than 10. For kids in middle and high school, these are not old people. Middle and high school, they're more likely than adults to spread the virus according to studies. And so every bit of what he said was wrong. I want you guys to remember your high school experience, your middle school experience. Lockers, uh, switching classes every hour, going from uh, your, your math class over to science. Um, you're crossing a lot of people in a crowded hallway and doing a lot of talking within this three to four minute span you have to get from one class to the next. Do you think that is a, is a, is a nice environment for something like this? Or Because by the way, they're saying he and Betsy DeVos, schools need to completely and utterly reopen, reopen fully is what they said. They were complaining about things where there were staggered schedules, where there was kids coming at certain times and different days and half days and certain things like that. They were against all those things. So anyone that's ever been in high school, remember your experience there, or people that are in high school now. Does that seem like a place where you can just roll through and just not have any kind of interactions or an exchange of, of airspace with anyone else? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't yeah. make any sense whatsoever. And then so when you continue to say it over and over and over and over again, people look up and go, this doesn't make any sense because reality, my own reality, tells me this is BS. I don't yeah. get it. I don't get it. I, honestly, because of that. None of this is sticking. None of it. Because teachers were also, they're saying, I'm risking my life here. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have to deep clean. Teachers have to deep clean their own classrooms between, even if they had these staggered schedules, in between kids coming back and forth. How? Who trusts them? Or do, you, do you trust Miss Harris to clean the class correctly before your kid comes in there? Yeah. She doesn't know what she's doing. 100%. By the way, oh, I'm sorry. She has to have her gun under her desk in case some some school shooter comes in too. The things we're putting <laughs> on teachers do uh, instead of teach in the middle of all this is astronomical. Oh, and if a teacher says, "Hey, how about you guys pay me more than thirty five thousand dollars a year?" They'll go, "Look at this lazy uh, yep. teacher who wants to go ahead and demand all this money from us. We don't have any money from this. We're only the richest country in the world." Yeah, <sighs> yeah. We expect you to take down terrorists survive in a high disease environment and do all of it without requiring any money or resources of any kind. Um, yeah. And so, by the way, like, like if it is, you know, 30 or 40 percent of the teachers that are old enough that according to his logic, they should stay home, um, they will need to be replaced. Is he providing resources for that? Is he suggesting that there should be resources yep. for that? Of course yeah, what not. What happens when they go home? What happens when they go home? Yeah. By the way, I just saw a study. So um, they what the researchers did was they checked the keyboards of multiple professions and on average and took a look at how much bacteria there was or germs there were on all these different professions keyboards the teachers do you know how theirs compared to the yeah. average amount Ugh. 27 times as many Ugh. germs oh <laughs> it's know a disaster that. and i'm look i we shouldn't be it. laughing but it's like a defense mechanism this is this is this is murder effectively we already know this. When it comes to any other normal colds, flus, whatever symptoms people get from school, we know we always said it many times. Schools, especially uh, uh, you know, with younger children that aren't as hygienic as people get older, uh, they're like they're petri dishes for sickness. Yeah, even just are. the ones that we're used to, it happens. Every teacher I've ever known has told me this, and they know. I mean, you don't have to tell me that to know it. We've all been in school too. It's what happens there. So if it's something this severe. What makes you think they're going to be comfortable doing this? Oh, and they got to think about how to get through this geometry lesson. <laughs> Come on, man. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and be watching for shooters too. Keep one hand on your on your on your gap. Uh, anyway, yeah, just absolutely devastating. President Obama, of course, gave uh, a eulogy as part of the eulogies that were given to John Lewis uh, during the the, the commemorative um, you know uh, event that was held not that long ago, and uh, he spoke at that event about voter suppression, democracy, in fact, as well as, you know, um, you know, in, in documents. And uh, a lot of people liked that because it was true to the life and work of John Lewis. But of course, not everybody liked it. Uh, on Fox and Friends, Trump was asked about that speech as well. I thought it was a terrible speech. It was an angry speech. It showed this anger there that people don't see. He lost control. And he's been really uh, hit very hard by both sides for that speech. That speech was ridiculous. Uh, I think the answer is they both are just in a state. They, you know, it's just one of those things. We've redone 82 percent or something of the Obama thing. But no, I thought that speech was totally inappropriate, very bad. 
Okay, so yeah, he was angry. He lost. He just kept saying angry. I don't know why. For some reason, he was focused on trying to portray Obama as angry. Can't um, it out. Yeah, and uh, he was. He was. He lost control. It was too political. What was John Lewis again? Was he like? Was he like a kids author? He didn't really care about politics, <laughs> did he? He didn't live a life founded around politics and and all of that. And maybe voting that Obama was talking about. So it, it was, this is this is the it was, it was a Sarah Palin moment. He was on the phone with Fox and Renz. He had a list of things. Angry, detached, yeah. lost control. He was just reading from his hand. He goes, oh, here's my crib notes. Oh, angry, lost control, completely out of touch. Everyone yeah. else was mad at him, both sides. What are you talking about? And he goes, and this is the part, which state are, are, are they in? He goes, and just shows what state they're in. What state? Is it Nevada? <laughs> what is he talking about? <laughs> the state they're in. And I get it. He's saying a state of mind. Yes. Finish the sentence. The problem is, is he continues to just rattle off phrases that he thinks mean something, but it's just anger and to try to incite some kind of feeling in his racist base. He's like, let's just say things. Let's throw out words. Who cares if it makes any sense? Who mm -hmm. cares if there's a thought process behind it? As long as I say them, people go, that's right. Obama lost his mind. You know what? Fox viewers uh, had a chance to see of Obama at that uh, at, at the funeral. How much did they got a chance to see of him? This is the audience he's speaking to. Mm. I don't think Fox... Was uh was if they covered it, the ratings dropped off the table. You know why? Because no one wanted to see what yeah. Obama had to say. They definitely didn't want to see anything about John Lewis that was said not kindly. So he gets to portray it any way he wants to, and they'll go, and they'll tell their friends and family, "Hey, did you know that Obama uh, completely lost it at the John Lewis funeral?" Like, really? Yeah. When? Yeah, they'll just believe it. Um, and the thing is, like. Like I, I was, I was angry about the response to, um, you know, basically everything about John Lewis when he passed, in, including the speeches. But it's not like the the point that Obama was trying to make and that John Lewis was trying to make, like throughout their lives, effectively in this issue, is that uh, fundamentally the Republicans have turned against democracy and they want to stop as many people uh, from as possible from voting. I know we're supposed to pretend that that's not true, that both of the parties are just, they're, they, they care about representative democracy and all that. It's not true and we're not going to pretend that it is. Um, but the thing is, when you point it out, it's not like they're going to go, ah, you got us. Ah. <laughs> no, they're going to fight back. And so they're not going to applaud the speech, obviously. It, it barely even, I guess I'm sort of mad at myself. It isn't news that they don't like a speech that identifies the anti-democratic path they are walking down. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. of course he's not going to like it. They are trying to strip you of your democracy, and to do so, they need to fool you into thinking that it's not happening, or that if it does happen, it's for the best, and they're doing both of those things simultaneously. That's all Trump is doing. That's all Kilmeade in, in, in uh, attacking uh, what Obama said. That's all he's doing. Tucker Carlson... One of the biggest racists in the country, he immediately attacked Obama for that speech because, of course, he's going to. He wants a an exclusively white authoritarian government. That's what he wants. And speeches like that make it slightly less likely that that will happen. So he's going to be yeah. against it. I was going to not say it, but what's the uh, what's the chances that Trump is upset about him talking about voting rights and things at John Lewis's uh, uh, funeral? And that he's upset about it because he doesn't know that that was a big part of his life. What's the chances? I mean, because in the Axios interview, he was asked about John Lewis and he didn't have anything good to say about him because he didn't know anything about him, except that he didn't come to his party. So in this case, he's like, what's Obama talking about voting rights for? This is John Lewis's funeral. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, during the Axios interview, he did say that he gave a lot of heart for the civil rights movement. But many other people did. Um, yeah. So he at least acknowledges that he knows that John Lewis is one of several people. He may not be sure exactly who. Um, yeah. I don't know. Just throwing it out there. That's true. We have been wondering what, if anything, the government is going to do to help those being devastated in a variety of different ways in terms of health or economics or housing uh, from the pandemic and the associated economic catastrophe that we're in right now. Uh, on the eve of that aid needing to be continued, they did nothing. They went on a three-day weekend, but finally they're back and the negotiations are apparently continuing. Here is some of what the White House has apparently offered. 
They want to extend the federal unemployment enhancement at a flat rate of $400 per week down from the now lapsed level of $600 per week. Although bear in mind that even if this were passed today, which it won't be, it will take literally weeks for states to resume those payments. They want to extend the federal eviction moratorium until mid-December, and they want $200 billion in state and local funds to be made available, up from zero in the initial Senate Republican proposal. So that is currently, those are the highlights of what they're offering. Uh, JR, more or less than you thought that they would? Um, Definitely more. I, I, I didn't see any reason why the White House would think they wanted to extend mostly that unemployment enhancement. Um, rate, but you know they're looking to at least drop it to appease at some point some of the rich people that pay them. Um, but so because just and the only reason I'm I thought that it's because the way that Steve Mnuchin and everyone else in the, uh, in the White House bubble have been talking down unemployment enhancement benefits for people, basically saying that Americans aren't worth it. So you know we'll tout how much we love America. Yeah, America's the best in the world, but we don't extend that graciousness towards our citizens. We just go. You guys are lazy. What's the matter with you? You're never going to want to work again because you don't like working. Uh, I'm not sure where all these assumptions come from, but the fact that they're even trying to uh, push for this 400 a week, I think, is strictly because of the pressure that's being put on them because they look so bad right now, and it's because of an election year. If it was not election year for all these guys, they would not even be trying to push this part, in my opinion. I, I think that that's almost certainly the case. Like they, they have to be looking out at the polls and realizing, oh, it turns out that if you leave people to suffer and die and become homeless— um, because the government just refuses to do nothing, that could hurt you in an election. <laughs> and so maybe they'll temporarily do it uh, for that. Only for that. Not because they actually care about the human devastation. Absolutely. Or indeed, even the damage to the economy, oddly enough. They don't seem to care enough about that. So um, here's my reaction to the White House's offer. Um, overall, I guess it would be one of my fingers raised. Guess which one? But on the <laughs> unemployment enhancement, the fact that it's 400 Rather than rather than six hundred is devastating. I don't think a lot of progressives were saying six hundred seems like too much. Um, it's more than the one hundred that the Senate wanted to continue, I guess. Okay. But I worry about that now seeming reasonable at four hundred because of the initial offer. Exactly. The Democrats' initial offer should have been two thousand dollars flat rate to every American while this is continuing. So bear that in mind. Extending the federal eviction moratorium until mid December is twenty five percent good. Um, maybe 10% good because first of all, the moratorium doesn't protect all renters. It protects a certain quantity of them, something like a third. So in that respect, it's not wide enough. It's not long enough because I have a feeling that by mid-December, we'll still be in a pandemic regardless of who wins in the election. So it's not wide enough. It's not long enough. It's also not enough because we don't just need an eviction moratorium. We need assistance to renters, assistance to homeowners, um, There are some who, you know, hypothetically might be working a little bit, don't qualify for unemployment, but they're still being devastated by the the economic collapse that's come along with the pandemic. So it's 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 not enough in nearly every in every regard. And in terms of the money to state and local funds, I I don't know if 200 billion dollars is nearly enough. I have reason to believe it's not, which we'll get to. But I also know that they're still slow rolling on uh, providing assistance to make sure that the election will be run um, in a way that protects people's lives and their rights. Um, and so this is better than I guess I would have expected an offer from Trump to be. And that's about it. It's worse in every other way than my yeah, makes, very low expectations. Yeah, it makes you ask the question, what what is the motivation for people in this White House to do something more for the American people? Because they keep talking about the motivation for Americans to go back to work. Because if we give them money, they're never going to want to be motivated to go back to work. What is your motivation for doing something to help in this pandemic? Maybe if you actually gave Americans what they're worth and what can actually help stimulate this economy as we go through this, You'll, you'll light a fire under your butt to maybe do something more about implementing policies or, or, or encouraging people to, to, uh, to practice safe things while we go through this and we can get our economy back sooner. If nothing else, uh, it, would, it would force them to go, man, we're, we're doling a lot of money every month to all these Americans. Let's get on the ball and get this done. Yeah. They have no motivation to do that. They give you nothing. By the way, not give you nothing. Um, uh, provide what you've already paid for. Let's go ahead and give the correct language here because they keep yes. telling us that Americans – They this is uh, Steve Mnuchin the other day said, uh, we're not going to pay uh, – we, we, we're not going to pay this much to Americans. You're not paying anybody, Steve. Mm-hmm. That's not your money. It's bro. not. <laughs> it is quite literally – and I want to be clear. I am using the word literally the way it is intended to be used. It is <laughs> literally those people's money that they paid. And Steve Mnuchin, he's rich. So I doubt he's paying a dollar in taxes. 
Certainly. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, no, it's not his money. And um, I would be perfectly happy to go from now until my grave, never hearing Steve Mnuchin talk about how ridiculous it is that we give people who've lost their jobs because of the pandemic money. I am so sick of it. I can't even express how sick of it I am. So anyway, uh, that's the check-in. They have apparently decided we're going to have a deal by Friday. Mm-hmm. Yay. That means, mm-hmm. what, three weeks for people who are unemployed with no payments? Um, I have to assume for a lot of people, if you are receiving unemployment payments, uh, three weeks is about as long as it takes for you to not be able to pay your rent, hypothetically, and for you to be kicked out. And uh, as of right now, eviction moratorium, well, first of all, there was no moratorium for the vast majority of people. But mm-hmm. even for those where it was there, hypothetically, maybe we'll have a deal on that part. We'll see. What a failure of a government. Jeffrey Epstein, thankfully, is now gone. But while he was alive, he did a lot of damage. And much of the damage that he he did was uh, aided along by the connections he had to wealthy individuals, well-connected, powerful individuals, that not only got him off the hook when the pressure was on him, but that introduced him to people, opened up new circles for him to um, engage in as a predator. And one of those circles we're now finding out about was long denied to have been available to him. So we have this new book. It's The Grifters Club, Trump Mar-a-Lago, and the Selling of the Presidency. That is apparently available now, written by a number of Miami Herald journalists and a a former Herald reporter who's now with The Wall Street Journal. And here is what they've found. So the book contains a major revelation about Jeffrey Epstein and Mar-a-Lago. It's known that Epstein was a regular at the club for many years and Trump's friend, which oddly enough hasn't hurt Trump for some reason, despite the fact that we have this crazy Q cult that thinks that child trafficking is, you know, happening everywhere. They don't care about the evidence that it actually did. At some point, the Trump organization has said that Trump banned Epstein from the property but it insisted he was never actually a member. He just visited a couple of times. Well, the Grifters Club reveals that Epstein was in fact listed as a member of Mar-a-Lago. The authors viewed a membership log that includes Epstein with an address at his mansion in Palm Beach. The log says his account was closed in October 2007. We have some information about why that happened. Previously reported court records state that Trump banned Epstein from visiting the club for an alleged sexual assault on a girl. We were told the young woman was the daughter of a member, and Trump kicked his friend out to protect Mar-a-Lago's brand. Because the club's membership is a closely guarded secret, no one has known the full extent of Epstein's ties to Mar-a-Lago until uh, our reporting. And this is the reporting uh, now available in that book. And so... He wasn't just partying with Trump for literally years, including at his club. He was a member of the club. I don't know how much worse that makes it, but the fact that they lied to conceal that fact implies at least a little bit worse. Yeah, it says a lot. You know, whenever you lie and your lie gets exposed, it brings up a bunch of other questions. Why did you lie then? I mean, it's, it's of course, it was to separate themselves from it and, and to seem like they're coming out free and clear when it's obvious he was a buddy of yours. There's quotes about how close of a buddy he was of yours. Uh, But then again, it's so weird that that's even considered a way out. But even if that was the case, you can say, oh yeah, I've had this this well-known pedophile and human child trafficker come into my house so many times. But I mean, I didn't always invite him. Sometimes he just showed up, but he came in anyway. So why are you buddies with him then? If Mm -hmm. you're buddies with him that much, you had no idea what he was doing. People I've known for decades, I know a lot about them. I don't just kind of casually know them for a decade. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't make much sense, but that was considered what we're supposed to buy uh, as as we go through this. And then when you come out lying about it, what else did you not tell us? But what if, JR, what if you didn't really know him or what he was like or what he was up to? What if that was the story? And what if that was the story and you had said in 2002 that Epstein likes beautiful women as much as I do and many of them are on the younger side? The, the, that's the quote, horrifying that, the quote should should never like that's all it takes that should Cut be all it back. takes that's it that's it he said he said it but again it's it's like racism unless you say the n-word but if you say thug or if you say um uh, these people don't have enough intelligence or yeah they're all criminals if you say all that stuff that's not racist but you have to say the n-word in order for you to finally be considered a racist so in this case trump has to say yeah i did that with these children just like my buddy epstein before we believe it but again, you don't have to believe it, but he basically said, that's my boy. You know what he's been doing. Even if he didn't participate in it, he knew about it. Yeah. 
And I just have to say, well, first of all, let, let, let's play this video because it, it's one part of the Axios interview that we didn't get to. But it certainly is strange. Trump was asked about that fact that he had, like, without, ne- it was totally unnecessary, just decided to wish Ghislaine Maxwell, um, another rapist of children, that he wished her well. Here he is being asked about that. Mr. President, the other day a reporter asked you about Ghislaine Maxwell. You said, quote, I just wish her well, frankly. I've met her numerous times over the years, especially since I lived in Palm Beach, but I wish her well, whatever it is. Mr. President, Ghislaine Maxwell has been arrested on allegations of child sex trafficking. Why would you wish such a well, person first of all, well? I don't know that, but I do know that. She has. She's been arrested for that. Her you know that. friend or boyfriend Epstein. was either killed or committed suicide in jail. She's now in jail. Uh huh. Yeah, I wish her well. I'd wish you well. I'd wish a lot of people well. Good luck. Let them prove somebody was guilty. I mean, you do you know that. Oh, she's so you're guilty? saying you hope she doesn't die in jail? Is that what you mean by wish her well? Her boyfriend died in jail, and people are still trying to figure out how did it happen? Was it suicide? Was he killed? And I do wish her well. I'm not looking for anything bad for her. I'm not looking bad for anybody. And they took that. And I mean, they she's made a child. Such, sex, alleged such child. Such a sex traffic, big though. deal. But all it is is right. her boyfriend died. He died in jail. Was he killed? Was it suicide? I do. I wish her well. Yeah, it's so weird in a number of different ways. It's, I don't know if weird. it's an implied yeah. threat that he keeps repeating, like in that context. But also the defensiveness about, oh, I know, I don't know what her charges are. I don't, I don't know anything about it. And also prove that someone was guilty. And he gets cut off, but he's implying that he doesn't believe that it's the case, despite the fact that many, many women have said that not only did Maxwell traffic them and groom them and manipulate them, but also rape them herself. So, I, I, well, I think we should give him the benefit of the doubt. It all checks out. You know, when Donald Trump says that um, he wishes everyone well that's in prison, that's his track record. Why don't we believe it? You know, the, the Central Park Five he had that he was putting out full page ads for to be murdered. Uh, by Wait, the did state. the ads say, I wish you well? <laughs> and the ads also said, oh, we don't know yet. You know, let's wait until it's proven that they're that they're guilty before we go out and say we want to murder all these kids. So... Uh, it's it, the, the fact that he can say that he wishes everyone well that goes to prison, whether or not they're guilty or innocent, just doesn't check out. And that should also be the next question. And I'm not expecting, uh, you know, uh, Johnson Swan to, to pull that out of his back pocket. But that's it's 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 a direct contradiction to who he's always been. We know the type of people that he wishes well in prison. These are the ones he's been pardoning. <laughs> and we yeah. know the type of people that he says are just criminals and deserve to be executed. And the ones that he has pardoned that were just low-level, maybe drug offenders that he's let out, you know what he's used them for? The whole reason he's even he, he ever did that was to con- continue to tout this whole, I've done more for black people than John Lewis ever could do. You know, I passed that legislation. No, you had no interest in that legislation. That legislation ended up being toothless. And people in your administration also tried to find a way to subvert that same legislation. Are we going to bring that part up yet? Because yeah. nothing that you've been trying to do when proving that you've done more for black people than anyone else checks out what it checks out is that you're trying to do as much as you can for pedophiles and and human traffickers of children than you could than you could do for anyone else yeah and uh i i i know that critics of this show would be surprised and not believe me when i say i don't like baseless speculation about things i have no idea about i really don't like that and Mm -hmm. so i don't know and we have to find out what we find out, and hopefully witnesses will stop turning up dead so that we can. But with everything that we know, come on. Come on. I know it's spatial speculation, and there, there's no reason that you should believe me or be influenced by what I think. But with everything that you know about Epstein, and everything that you know about Trump, and everything about what they want in life, what are we supposed to think? Come on, that Trump's above whatever I'm implying at this point. <laughs> Anybody think that? Too moral? No, wouldn't commit crimes. Wants to protect the young from from like predators. Worst part is you don't even have to speculate on what he potentially participated in in order to realize that he's on the wrong side of this and he's adamant about being on the wrong side of this. Even if you're a vehement support for him, for, for her and then her dead boyfriend. Your vehement support is bad enough. I, I, people speculate about Geraldo, and I, I wanted to reject that too because no one knows anything. So, I, you know, in his vehement defense of Maxwell. But 
we can point out how ridiculous this is and that you're a horrible human being for defending someone like this. Yeah. That's bad enough. Why, do, why does it have to go worse than that for us to finally go, man, you're a bad person? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, exactly. It, it, sometimes speculation isn't even necessary to have a gigantic issue <laughs> uh, with what's actually happening. Not long ago, we showed a video of uh, Janine Pirro who had uh, previously been supportive of people wearing masks, photographing herself doing it, and then re revealing now that she's totally against it and it's a plot to hide your identity. Well, also, in that same interview, she was asked about the vaccines that are being developed uh, for this virus, and I want to show you what she had to say about this, uh, this prospect. We just spent $2 billion to get 100 million uh, vaccines. I mean, who are you going to va vaccinate? I don't want a vaccine. I want a therapeutic. You know, until you tell me that that vaccine is safe and only time will tell until you tell me what the long term consequences of that vaccine are. I'm not interested in putting it in my body. And by the way, I'm older and I probably should be one of the people to be vaccinated, but I won't. I'm not going to allow them to do that to me. And then the question is, will you be forced to do it? You know? Or what freedoms will you lose if you don't do it? What property will you use? What privileges? And then it's to the China model where literally they have social scores. And if you're a good boy and girl, you can go on plane flights. And if you're not, then you can't. And your civil liberties get removed. A really, really smooth transition from I'm worried about a slippery slope to and then it's the China model where you just assert all of the things that... <laughs> anyway, um, so I I'm curious about what you thought about Piro there, about how she's saying that she won't take it. She'd prefer a therapeutic... She's suspicious and all of that. What do you think? Um, it's, it's, it's expected. It's why I was saying, I think it was, it was a couple weeks ago, we were doing uh, one of the common rooms, or I think it must have been that, where we were trying to figure out, we asked the general uh, question, how long before things are as close to normal as possible? And I, I spitballed it five years. Um, first Ugh. of all, because of the process for getting the vaccine. Then the process for getting people to want to take the vaccine enough where it's effective and enough people have, have, you know, have taken it. And is the convincing period of people to do so, which this is the beginnings of. You know, we don't even have the vaccine yet, and we're already saying what we won't do and all that stuff. And by the way, to throw a bone at some of these folks, because by the way, the flu vaccine is very common. A lot of people take it, but there's still very, very many people who don't mm -hmm. um, for many other reasons. Like, oh, I think it's going to make me sick to this. I don't really get sick. I'm not sick. Why would I put that in my body? All that stuff. And so the bone I'm throwing to them is I get that this is something that's so unknown. You don't know what it's going to do to you. That's why you can wait it out. You can chill. You can see what it's, what it's effectiveness is, what its side effects are, how it, how it, what it does to other people. If it's really working, all those things mm -hmm. Just stay in the house and keep your mask on. Then you can wait it out, but continue to be safe until you want to wait it out. If you don't want to do one thing, do the other. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's, here's the thing. What Piro said there is more interesting than it might seem to be on the surface. On the surface, it's um, she's playing to anti-vaxxers, which, you know, of course, a lot of people are going to do. Um, but, but it is interesting because, of course, she is telling people to be scared of a vaccine, despite the fact that hypothetically a vaccine is the thing that could cause the country to go back to normal, which would be good for everyone, including Donald Trump and other Republicans who want to show that they've beaten this thing. Trump is, after all, putting a lot of money and a lot of pressure on them to develop one as fast as possible. And she's yeah. sort of seemingly going against that, but in a way that I think we have to acknowledge is quite nuanced because... She says she doesn't want to to have one and that she's not sure if it's going to, you know, be tested thoroughly, what long term effects it could have. She has all these criticisms about it, but she is she is giving you those in a very specific way that makes it seem as if the the issue is just with doctors and the pharmaceutical industry and not the person who all reports is saying is putting pressure on them to do this as fast as possible. We're not going to go through all the the graphics we have, but in the New York Times, there's a report about a lot of concern from researchers that pressure is being put on vaccine developers by the White House to get this out as fast as possible, and especially before the election. And so if you're concerned that they might rush this out without quite enough testing and all of that, it isn't just a thing. It's the White House doing that, but she Absolutely. doesn't mention that because she wants to have her grift and eat it too. She <laughs> wants to get the anti-vaxxers to support her, but not be seen to be criticizing the president. 
and 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 really fast i think that this is complex i think that a vaccine is necessary to save lives to get things back to normal i don't think until we have it we can get back to normal and i think that anti-vaxxers will take even the most tried and true decades old vaccine and have an issue with it i also acknowledge that rushing this sort of thing is consequential and, you know, there are questions of who it's going to be deployed to first, how accessible it's going to be, how much it's going to cost. And we know that medical experimentation and testing has had a long history in America of being racially discriminatory and dangerous as a result of that. So this is a very complex topic. I don't know Janine Pirro is thinking about all of those components, but we should as well. Yeah, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fight on so many different fronts. Um and we'll see what all comes out. Again, like I said, I, I can I can see the fear because it's so new. Um, but that's why you ask questions and have conversations and actually trust the people that are in charge here. That's what I've always said before, too, is uh, if, if you've been the boy who's cried wolf so many times, if you stumble across something that actually makes sense or works or is the truth, no one wants to believe you anymore because you've lied 99.9% .9 of the time so much. Yeah. Why would we trust something from you? Why? Because in April, there was like some memo that the White House put together once they finally internally decided that this is something that, that it needs to be addressed. The primary thing they said was vaccine by October. Yeah, I wonder why that is. That was the plan then. Not, not vaccines so we can help people, not vaccines so we can make sure we have safe trials and American people are protected. It was, let's get this done by October just yeah. because. There's FDA officials, there's people that are worried that he's going to he's going to rush this just for himself and that all checks out yeah yeah and look I'll, all i can say is um you know when when the the trials are done to the extent that i can i'm going to look at them and talk about it i'm going to have people on who can look at the results and figure out all of that um yeah yeah it's necessary i can say that but we do need to make sure that it's safe and while talking about the concerns we don't need to go into crazy town like a lot of that discussion historically uh, has been yeah. in America. So one of the big stories of the 2020 re-election bid by Donald Trump is who that supported him in 2016 no longer has his back. You'll see these profiles about farmers in Iowa, truck drivers. Do they still support the incumbent? Um, and he doesn't want to lose those people, but there's some other people he might miss more. And joining us now to break down one of the most important families that might not be supporting him in 2020. We've seen your Washington correspondent for Business Insider, Dave Leventhal. Welcome back to the Damage Report. Hey, great to be with you. Uh, glad to have you here. So uh, let's talk about the Mercers. What, how big, how, how supportive were they in 2016? How important was that support and what's it looking like for 2020? Well, first, they were a huge deal on two levels in 2016. The first level may be the most obvious one, which is the financial level. They had inserted about eight plus or eight figures into the political bloodstream for Donald wow. Trump during the 2016 election and not directly to his campaign because of campaign finance limits that everyone runs into, but to super PACs, these organizations that can raise and spend as much money as they absolutely want to, to benefit a candidate or for that matter, beat up another candidate that they don't like. So they were at the top of the heap among those big dollar mega donors and in, in the same league with Sheldon Adelson and some of the other names that you frequently hear in Republican circles. But there was another factor for the Mercers too that, that made them really some of the most prominent people in Donald Trump's orbit. And that was who they connected Donald Trump with. At this time, mm -hmm. four years ago, the, the Mercers were instrumental in bringing aboard Kellyanne Conway to run Donald Trump's <laughs> campaign for the last 100 days. Uh, you might remember a guy by the name of Steve Bannon. Yeah, the Mercers were responsible for really? him too getting connected uh, with Donald Trump in large part. And then somebody who you don't hear uh, quite as much as the other two, but uh, a gentleman by the name of David Bossy. Even if he's not a household name, you might know of his organization, and that's Citizens United. Yes, that's Citizens United mm. of the Citizens United versus. Federal Election Commission Supreme Court case. And uh, so they were either the holy trinity or the unholy trinity, depending on your political persuasion uh, for Donald Trump going into <laughs> the final couple of months. And that all tracks back to the Mercers. 
Wow, okay, I did not know that that was the origin of some of those connections. I mean, incredibly important people early on to Trump like Bannon and that sort of thing. Obviously that relationship has fallen apart as well, as most of Trump's inevitably do. So very important back in 2016. So far, what's it looking like for 2020? I can see you in your article, you quote one of their associates saying they're 100% out. Are they 100% out? <laughs> well, the, the, the field looks fallow at this point for Donald Trump in terms of relying on the Mercers to come in and give a, a turbo boost to his campaign during these final three months. All indications, everyone who I spoke to, and I talked with five different associates of the Mercers who know them well in four of the cases, have spoken with them recently, either Rebecca, Robert Mercer's daughter, or Robert, the patriarch of the family, who's a billionaire in his own right and incredibly successful businessman. They're they're out every which way they could be out. They are not helping the campaign materially. They are not helping helping the campaign financially. The only indication that they were going to help Trump at all came early in the year in February when Robert Mercer made a contribution to what's called a joint fundraising committee of the Republican Party, which divvies up money to all different types of political groups, including the Trump campaign. So really all Donald Trump has to show from the Mercers this election cycle is $5,600, which of course is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction Mm. of what he was worth to Donald Trump back in 2016. So Yeah. yeah, don't expect them to get in, of course. Anything can happen. People can change their minds, but if you're a betting person, then you know bet against the Mercers getting in. Wow. I mean, then the obvious fault then would be why? Why this massive shift from 2016 to 2020? Um, is there something they wanted from Trump in these years that they didn't get? Do they feel like they got everything that they needed? What explains this turnaround? Uh, our reporting indicates a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, they uh, it, Donald Trump himself. Uh, they are a the Mercers are very private. They are very quiet, they don't seek the spotlight, even if they have given money to those who do seek the spotlight. And Donald Trump has said things, Donald Trump has done things that would seem to conflict with some of the orthodoxy, politically speaking, of the Mercers. That might be in foreign affairs for sure, definitely when it comes to immigration. Really the indication that we got of that came in 2018 when the Mercers, or Rebecca Mercer specifically, wrote a letter to the Wall Street Journal and talked about some of her beliefs that seemed at the time to very much either conflict with Donald Trump's beliefs or or at least you could sense some dissonance there too. Also to a lot of the people who the Mercers had been supporting, Steve Bannon, also to John Bolton, the national security advisor for Donald Trump for about 18 months. Those are Mercer people, Bolton's a big Mercer person, and both of them flamed out. Kellyanne Conway really is the only person who remains firmly, squarely in Donald Trump's not only orbit, but inner sanctum. So there were some kind of personnel rifts in personality rifts that you had there too. Also, we talked about gambling just a moment ago. Well, Robert Mercer, he's a big poker player, okay? And he likes to make good bets. He's made great bets on business. He's made great bets in the past on politics. And from talking with, again, a few of his associates about this very topic, they basically said the same thing independently of each other, which is that they don't consider, the Mercers that is, Donald Trump to be a good bet in 2020. If they're gonna Mm. spend political money, they're gonna spend it Elsewhere, they're going to spend it on the consolation of nonprofit organizations, conservative nonprofit organizations that they fund and support, or perhaps they're just going to keep their powder dry for a later date, the 2022 Mm. midterms, the 2024 presidential elections. They have options Mm. and they're not being hasty about it. Yeah, yeah, that 2024 cycle. I mean, you know, we got to start talking about it in just a few months. It is American politics. I mean, Uh, no, you're you're totally right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, So maybe you already sort of answered this, but I was curious if they're out on Trump, they think he's unlikely to win or they don't care or whatever. Are they out on the Republican Party in 2020 or are they donating to other candidates? Are they trying to maintain you know, the, the Republican control of the Senate? Are they trying to take back the House? You mentioned nonprofits, is it explicitly pulled out of all electoral uh, campaigns? They've, they've in in a major way, yes. Now they've made a couple of uh, you know, kind of perfunctory 
contributions, Susan Collins, who's running for the US Senate, for example. Uh, but really, uh, mm. when, when we talk about mega donors, people who are giving hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, or even in, in a couple of cases, tens of millions of dollars, and giving that to the cause of a candidate or the cause of a party, the Mercers are off the board here. They are not in that rank as they were uh, very much in 2016 yeah. when they were at the top of the heap. They were a top 10 mega donor family for the 2016 election cycle, and they're not even going to crack the top thousand this time around uh, oh. if things remain the way that they are. So, I mean, one final question. I, I, I guess this is more. This is more speculative, but I'm curious from your point of view. Um, if he's not getting this help in the in the money that he was was in 2016, if they're not going to be you know pointing him to individuals that could help his campaign like in 2016, how much does this hurt Trump? How much does he need the Mercers? It's absolutely not going to help him any. Now, Donald Trump, mind you, is going to have plenty of cash. His campaign has a ton of cash. The Republican National Committee has a ton of cash. Uh, America First Action, which is a big super PAC supporting him, has a lot of cash, but in this most critical time when people are going to pay attention more than they have at any point in the race, Joe Biden is ascendant. He's raising more money than Donald Trump through his own campaign than Donald Trump's campaign is raising. The super PACs and other outside organizations that are supporting Joe Biden, they're raising more money than the money that's coming in in Trump's analogous super PACs. So, hey, this is crunch time right now. Donald Trump is on the slide, Biden is going up when it comes to money. And that's not where you wanna be if you're gonna be in a tight race. And also too, of course, John, the poll numbers are going the wrong way for Donald Trump. So if he's gonna make a comeback and try to close some of those polls, well, he's gonna need a lot of money to do it in order to convince people that he's somebody who deserves a second term. Wow, Dave Leventhal, uh, amazing reporting as we've come to expect from you. Thank you for joining us and, and breaking this down. Hey, thank you, John. Here at the damage report, like many people, yesterday morning we were absolutely shocked at the footage of a massive explosion going off in a port in Beirut, wondering what it means, what effect it's had, how many must have been injured or died in this absolutely devastating explosion. And and thankfully, some information is now starting to be made available. And joining us now to help understand this situation is investigative journalist and the founder of Beirut Report, Habib Bata. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, glad to have you here. So, um, you know, I, I, I apologize. We were talking before uh, going uh, live with the interview. I, I'm sure you've had to answer many of these questions before, so I apologize uh, for that. Um, but, but I am, but I am curious. When it happened, um, you know, were, were you nearby? What was that experience like? Well, I had just um, driven past the explosion site ten minutes earlier, which is the port of really? Beirut. Um, and uh, you you can't avoid the port of Beirut if you're in Beirut. You it's right along the highway. So I've driven past it my whole life, almost every day at some point. Um, and that was you know, I was very lucky and thankful that I got out of there. I just I was in traffic. About ten minutes later, I pulled over to get some stuff from a pharmacy. I was probably a couple miles away down the highway, and I went into the pharmacy and um, I heard a, a like a just a little thud while I was talking to the pharmacist. And I, I thought it's an Israeli sonic boom because I've lived through those my whole life. And I thought they must be bombing the South and having another war as they do. And so um, I looked up at the sky and all of us, you know, our instinct is Lebanese to look up at the sky when we hear an explosion, you know, because we're used to getting the airstrikes. And I didn't see anything. And I turned back around to the pharmacist and we were just kind of chit chatting. Um, joking about the situation, how bad it is, and then it just just moved through my body. I mean, and the loudest noise you've ever heard in your life. Um, it felt like the building was collapsing that was behind oh, me. Wow! And and everybody felt that way. It, it, it's like if you look at the damages, it looks like every building got bombed, and there are like hundreds of buildings that were affected. And so this is like thousand times more than the Oklahoma City bombing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it, it's almost like the closest thing you can get to an atomic bomb. It was a, a proper mushroom cloud. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know it's like like a, like a, like a movie, like your worst fantasy of what it would be like. You know, in Lebanon, we always think about what it would be like because you're always getting bombed. And 
And it was, yeah, it was every bit that. And um, I could just feel it in my bones and it kind of just stays with you. You know, even if you're not injured, it just the the, the, the vibration. Um, and I just jumped in my car and I, I raced home and people were driving crazy and people were outside of their homes and uh, everybody was outside looking and police were looking and you know, it's like it's when the police don't know what's going on, that feels yeah. really weird. And I, as I got a little bit higher, I live a little bit in the hill, uh, just right outside of Beirut, um, I could see the whole city was in a cloud as big as the city of black smoke. Uh, was totally like you couldn't see the city anymore. Um, so it was, uh, I was very lucky. I was very lucky because a lot of people were badly injured, 5,000 people, um, 200,000, uh, the government says, are homeless. Um, tonight, oh my God. Uh, an entire city. Of, well, I mean, the city's probably about a million and a half. Uh, no, I mean, so. but but like it's a, a city full of people, effectively, that have been made homeless inside of this this larger city, and it's just devastating. On top of the deaths and the injuries, the the long term impact. I can't even imagine this scale. You you felt you felt the shockwave miles away. You yeah, know, I'm I mean, curious people, when people people heard it in Cyprus, which is like 150 miles away. Wow, and when you were, you said you were initially you were you were talking to people, people are trying to figure out what what happened. They're trying to read from the authorities. Do they have any information? I mean, like because there was the fire beforehand, many people were filming it, and so everyone has now seen you know any number of different shots of it. It really did look like a small instantaneous nuclear weapon um, had exploded very briefly. Was th- was there a widespread belief that this was some sort of attack? Did it take long for the information about what the nature of the bomb actually was to distribute? Yeah, I mean, you know, living here, uh, you get a flashback every time there's a bombing. You remember the last big bombing that you went through. And I was started thinking about the assassination of the prime minister back in 2005 and how that shook the building that I was in. Um, but this felt like twice as strong. I mean, I felt the, 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 the vibration of American made bunker buster bombs. That Israel has dropped so many times um, on this on this uh, city uh, during the 2006 war, and this was nothing compared to those. I mean, this was just like a times ten. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it was you know, and 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 I and I and so you think immediately I, we're under attack. That's what I thought. You know, we're under attack, and I gotta I gotta run. I gotta take cover. But then you think, do I drive slow? Do I drive fast? Will I get hit? Will I not get hit? You know, um, uh, you know, we've we've lived our lives uh, like this, but um, this felt like wow, this is a really escalation. I mean, for people from Beirut to say that this was the biggest bomb that they have seen, that's saying a lot, because we've seen almost every kind of bomb in this city over the past thirty years. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, we did feel like we're under attack, and um, and 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 everybody thought it was a plane, an airstrike, um, or, or an assassination. You know, two of the main kind of uh, avenues of violence that we've seen, uh, munitions delivered to us. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it, it was it was it was really a, a feeling of anxiety and fear. Yeah, you know, um, so I automatically begin to to wonder, like, when you see the the scale of the devastation to the port, that the port looks looks destroyed. It looks like it, you know, is, is back to almost nothing. How how do you recover from this? As you said, hundreds of buildings destroyed. I saw quotes from people saying that the damage to the buildings is beyond anything they've seen in the wars over the past few years. Is is any are people really even thinking about recovery yet, or is are they still just responding in shock to what what happened yesterday? People are out in the streets today, you know, um, taking stock. Uh, small mom and pop businesses. So many small businesses in Lebanon. It's a country full of little mom and pop stores. Um, everything is kind of family owned uh, for the most part in this country. And so you had this um, hundreds of shops, uh, lots of like cool bars and, and nice places to eat. And it was like a trendy part of town, bohemian part of town, and also just like the regular working class part of town all mixed in. It's all mixed in in Lebanon, uh, the high rises and the, and the little old hundred year old buildings. and. Uh, you really just see these people, and they say, "Who's going to help us? You know, who's going to who's going to help us rebuild our lives? You know, these are working class people who uh, who invested their whole life in their little small uh, convenience store, um, and, and 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 their house their house was like above, so they lost their house and they lost their business, and and they're bro- and they're already bankrupt and broke, 
and everybody's already bankrupt and broke in Lebanon because the government's broke. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're undergoing, we were in a, an economic collapse. We were in a catastrophe and then this hit us. So, so you know, there's no FEMA in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. There's no, um, you know, uh, great ins big institutions that are 100 years old that can help you do things. Um, big government, you know, help. There's none of that because the government can't even put the lights on in this country. You know, we sit in the dark 16 hours a day in the dark. We, we live on generators. Um, you know, so, so, you know, it, it, it's like, how, how much worse can it get? You start to think. Um, I think it's important people understand the economic context. We, you know, we have a currency crisis, we're in hyperinflation. That means the currency has lost 80% of its value. That means whatever money you have in your pocket, whatever money you have in the bank, whatever money you make uh, monthly as a salary, slash it by 80% and then try to go and feed your family. Um, this is all before uh, jobs have been slashed. The hospitals that are treating patients have just fired 800 employees a few weeks ago because the combination of the pandemic and this currency devaluation um, has driven them out of business. Uh, hospitals can't pay their bills. Hospitals can't really afford medicine because people can't afford hospitals. Um, the government owes hospitals so much money they can't pay it back. So I mean, how is the government going to help all these people? Who's going to help these people? Um, they're very. They, there was a homeless person. There was a homeless person who was interviewed, and he said, "Look at this. I can't even sleep on the street anymore. There's no sleep. There's no street to sleep on." Uh, the street was full of rubble. All the cars were full of rubble. People are trying to, you know, take apart things. Few people that can afford it, but most of the things are just sitting there, broken, damaged. Hundreds of stores, hundreds of shops, thousands of apartments blown out. My friend sending me pictures of their apartments. Glass pieces of glass fly through the apartment like knives, stabbing their furniture. You know, some of them were lucky not to be home. Uh, them and their kids, they could have been gone. Um, you see all these videos, people filming it. They're filming the fire, like you said, and they're thinking they're kind of like, oh, you know, they're not taking it serious. Oh, it's a fire. Look how they're going to put it out. And then you see people just, boom, the camera flies, and you know, the camera's gone. Yeah. You don't know if they survived. You don't know if the video you're watching is somebody who died who yeah. filmed that. Um, so there's just, there's just so much um, trauma uh, going on and so little um, help. Yeah. The. Uh, so as you talked about the the context prior to the bomb was was disastrous in a number of different ways. Um, the description I've read of what caused the explosion, the the fact that all of that material had been sitting there for something like six years at this point, that there had been warnings even recently. Um, someone I saw, some official had said, if this explodes, it will take out the city effectively. Um, will it, will that lead to any change in government? Will people? I mean, the, the fact that this is hypothetically something that could have been avoided—that it wasn't, you know, a, a different sort of tragedy, an attack, or something like that—but hypothetically, that this did not have to happen at all—is that something that that people are thinking about? Do you think that it's likely to lead to anything politically happening? Look, people are extremely angry. Um, uh, they feel betrayed. Um, you know, they feel they've been betrayed. I mean, their whole life, you know, this, as I said, it's not just, this is not the first uh, tragedy. It's a huge tragedy. A lot of people have died, but people have been dying in Lebanon for decades um, and, and years uh, because they can't afford healthcare, because they can't, you know, the, their diseases, the air is polluted, the water is polluted, um, you know, the garbage piling up on the streets, you know, all kinds of chemicals and the food that we eat, they're all kind of food scandals. Uh, every once in a while. So people, every every scandal and every major thing makes people angry. Obviously, this is like a tectonic boom um, compared to the other things that we've experienced uh, because just of the physicality of it, the visceral nature of it. Um, but, you know, political systems, I think uh, we underestimate them and they're very well entrenched. And those politicians have been there for a long time and they spent a lot of effort getting there. Um, and they, they don't just go away. And when people see events and tragedies, uh, they tend to believe the story that that makes them feel comfortable, um, that they've been raised to believe, what their fathers believed, and you know, and so uh, people will automatically read this story in different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Some will say, uh, "I heard a plane; it's the Israelis. 
Um, it was a missile. Others will say it's Hezbollah. They're bringing in arms uh, from Iran. Um, we don't have any evidence either way, but people already started sharing the story and tweeting it that way. Um, some of the influential people, journalists, some of them, uh, you know, they take positions very, very quickly. Uh, the revolutionaries of Beirut, you know, they've been very brave. They've fought eight or nine months in the streets trying to remove the government. It hasn't really happened. We did have a resignation with the prime minister. Um, however, the new prime minister is seen as not a huge improvement. Um, although he's kind of an outsider, people wanted more. Um, a lot of the a lot of the government ministers were not really uh, that far from the previous uh, regime uh, and the parties that run the country. You know, Lebanon's a country run by militias. It's not really a state. It's like a militias competing uh, to run a country. And they don't work together. There's no teamwork. There's no team spirit. They, they treat it like they're still in the war. And these are the same individuals who led tank battalions through the streets and neighborhoods of Beirut, blasting each other and blasting this whole country. They're the ones that are in charge to this day. Um, and they have their followers and they have their loyalists. And they have, and they, there's a reason behind that. You know, these people st- stood by them in the war, they defended their neighborhoods. They believe in them, whether it's true or not. Um, to think that we can just uproot all of that. Because we're angry, um, I don't know. I mean, I hope, I really hope that we see a change in this country. But we've been fighting for it for months and years. And let's not forget, the militia leaders themselves thought they were revolutionaries. You know, they didn't come from money. A lot of them, uh, they fought a ruling class, uh, a landowning class in their day, back in the 70s and the 60s. Um, so, so you know, I think it's a very complicated thing to, to talk about political change. Uh, I don't think it happens without. Um, Blood, if it's going to be a real change and a really restart a system, but you know, imagine that in any system, you know, can you just wipe away political parties? You can't just wipe away political parties, even though there's some people who are maybe ultra liberal and say, hey, I don't like any of the parties, but a lot of people say, hey, I do like these parties. Yeah. Um, so that's what we have in Lebanon. It's a kind of partisanship. It's a deep rooted. It's a part of a partisanship that's kind of uh, you know uh, combined with war experience and fighting experience. You know, so imagine the Republican Democratic parties were militias um, during mm-hmm. the Civil War. So you know, it, it's so complicated that it's really hard, I think, to untangle and undo that. But there is a new political force in the country uh, that has been emerging over these months and years, not just recently, but it's been building for years. And, and I've followed that, and I've been part of that. Um, and you know. They've achieved many small victories, you know, rejecting laws, fighting government projects, uh, trying to save environment, trying to fight destructive dam projects, World Bank projects, that kind of thing. And they've made some progress in many cases um, when it was really specific and targeted towards something. But just to say, I want to remove the entire political system. um, That's when you know less people will be involved. And so the protests really shrank from big numbers, just demanding you know change and frustration. The smaller numbers getting you know more violent, doing more rioting and that kind of thing, which you know 100% people have um, a, a need to vent this anger of living in this country. Um, but I think just because a country is really performing badly uh, economically and doesn't really work, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's a conspiracy against you. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that people have to realize that you know the global economy is unforgiving to small countries that make nothing. Um, and and we're a tiny country with no manufacturing, probably because we're always at war. You know, yeah. we're a country always at war. So how do you build an industry? How do you compete in the global economy? How do you make money? We don't make any money. That's the problem with Lebanon. We're constantly in debt, um, and the political forces in this country, uh, the militias, nobody wins. They all keep kind of keep going at at each other, and they don't lose because they're constantly propped up by the big rich countries, America, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, France. They have been all of Lebanon's history constantly supporting these rival militias. So Lebanon is like a joint venture between local warlords and you know um, big uh, countries that have an agenda to pursue. And it's like a kind of like we're like a chessboard, um, you yeah. know, where these moves are made between the world. So. That also it makes it so hard for this country to come together and fix things, and you know, because you need you need a, a, a clear chain of command to run a country. There is no chain of command in Lebanon. There's all these competing groups, and it's never really clear um, who's in charge of this country. And that's why I think this tragedy. We don't have to read it as some kind of conspiracy or something, because uh, when you have a system like that, there's no regulations. 
There's no regulatory bodies, there's no oversight, there's no transparency, there's no accountability, the courts don't work. Um, and, and so that, then you have, how can you expect safety measures to be taken with hazardous materials? I mean, I think we're just an accident waiting to happen in this country. Uh, you know, you, you don't need a terrorist to come in and, and mess up a country. You have a lot of dangerous things in your country, gasoline, flammable things, um, dangerous uh, bridges, all that stuff that could go wrong. Yeah. Um, if it's not properly managed and maintained, and nothing is maintained in Lebanon. We don't even have electricity. We don't even have traffic lights. All of the traffic lights are not working in Beirut right now because the government can't pay the bill to maintain them. So you could just die on the highway in Lebanon every day. There's no highway patrol, there's no police. You could drive however you want in this country. And um, people die every day on the highways. So, you know, we don't have potable water, we don't have sewage. <laughs> you know, all of our sewage gets pumped into the Mediterranean. Um, you know, so, so, so it's not surprising to me that something like this could happen. In this country, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, and and I really do appreciate. I mean, you describe it as complicated, and obviously, it very much is a, a tragedy in a in a place that was already experiencing so many others. And um, and because of that, and because you can provide so much of the historical background, we really do appreciate you joining us and giving us information. This is not, you know, this is not a part of the world that a lot of Americans have much information about. And so, uh, we really do appreciate you uh, joining us and, and sharing your experience. Thank you, happy to be here. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.